Hello and welcome to the next of our sessions. This one is on revenue recognition and that's covered under IAS 18. Now there's not a great deal to this standard so we can go through it fairly quickly. We want to know how much revenue to recognise and when to recognise it. And we need to split that down between when we're selling goods and we're selling services because the rules are different for each. So first of all, measurement. How much revenue should we recognise? Well, that's very straightforward because we recognise for a cash sale the immediate proceeds because we sold something for cash, we got cash, so we can recognise that cash amount. If it's a credit seal, well then we'll simply recognise the anticipated cash. Now we'll look at when we can recognise these in a moment, but I just want to mention the fact that if time value is material, let's say you don't expect to receive this money for three years, well then you need to discount it. And of course, any time we discount, we need to unwind that discounting over the time period until we receive the revenue. So if the time value is material, and really that means anything more than a year, then we discount it and unwind the discount. Let's just do an illustration of that to make sure that we could do it. So illustration one, have a go at it and then work through it with me. In illustration one, ABC has sold a large item of plant for 10 million on the first day of the year, but they don't expect to receive payment for 24 months, so two years. Um, we've got a discount rate of 10%, and basically what we need to do here is show the treatment for the next two years. So we're going to discount the revenue, and then we're going to unwind the discounting over the two years. So, at the start, we're going to need to create a discounted receivable. So, two years, discount rate 0 0.826. 10 million times 0 0.826 gives us 8260. So, we create a receivable for that, which will be debit receivables, credit revenue. So, we're recognising the revenue on the contract now. So... The next bit is that because this happened on the first day of the accounting period, we're going to need to unwind the discounting for year one. So to do that, we multiply the receivable by the discount rate of 10%. So that's 8260. And we unwind the discount by debiting the receivable to increase it and crediting the P&L. Now that's not more revenue, it's interest income. So just for the classification, it's interest income, not classified as revenue. The revenue will be the discounted amount up front, so the 8260. Now, moving into year two then, that means we've got an opening balance on the receivable of the original plus the unwinding of the discount, 9086. And all we need to do is unwind the discount again. So we unwind the discount 9086 times 10%, debit the receivable, credit the P&L again, and that leaves us with the closing balance on the receivable of 9994600. Now, there's a slight rounding difference. It's basically the 10 million, because remember, at the end of year two, they're going to actually pay the receivable. So that would be the closing balance, and then it's actually paid. And the only difference between the 10 million and that amount is slight rounding difference on the discount rates. So that's how we would treat uh, discounted revenue. So discount it up front and then unwind the discounting over the period until it is received. Now that we understand what revenue we can recognize. The key question is, when can we recognize it? And we're going to look first of all at the situation 
where we are selling goods as opposed to services, which we will look at in a moment. So if we're selling goods, we recognize the revenue on the transfer of the risk and rewards of ownership. So only when the risk and rewards of ownership have transferred from the seller to the buyer, can the seller recognize the revenue on that good. Really, you can boil that down into basically being on delivery because any time up to the point where you have delivered the goods, well, the risk and rewards of ownership rest with you. If you don't post the goods, well then it's your problem. If the goods are lost in post, well that's your problem as well. So until the customer actually has the goods, the transfer of the risk and rewards of ownership have not actually happened. So it's going to be on delivery. We cannot recognize the revenue until the goods are delivered. We also need a few other things. First of all, no management control maintained. So for example, if you sell the goods to a wholesaler who then sells them at a price stipulated by you, and perhaps they don't even pay you until they sell the goods, well, effectively they are just acting as an agent of yours. So you can't recognize the revenue until they sell the goods on. So you can't maintain management control of the goods. If you maintain management control and someone is, someone is merely acting as an agent of yours, you can't recognize the revenue. Also, we need a reliable measure. That's not usually too tricky, but we need to be sure of what we're going to get. And we need a probable flow of economic benefit. And that means you're probably going to get paid. That usually is a given because you're usually not going to sell the goods to someone who isn't going to pay you. But if, for example, you sold to someone that was in administration, you still felt that they were going to pay you, otherwise you wouldn't have sold the goods. But because they're in admission, there's a risk that you won't get the money. So you wouldn't be able to recognize the revenue until they actually paid you. So if there was some reason that you may not get paid, well then you couldn't recognize the revenue until it became probable that you would get that economic benefit. Lastly, we need to be able to reliably measure the costs involved. And again, that's not usually difficult because we've often paid the costs already. So that's not usually going to be a problem. So for the sale of goods, we need all of these, the transfer of the risk and rewards of ownership, which will usually be on delivery of the goods. We can't maintain management control. We need a reliable measure of what we're going to get. We need to have a probable flow of economic benefit, i.e. we're going to get paid. And we need to be able to reliably measure our costs. If we've got all of that, we can recognize the revenue involved. Now it's slightly different for services because if you're not selling goods, you're selling services, they're often going to be provided over a period of time. So it would be difficult to determine the transfer of the risk and rewards of ownership. So what you do with services is you recognize the revenue by stage of completion of the contract. Now that means you need to be able to measure the stage of completion, but so long as you can do that, you can recognize the revenue in that way. You still need a reliable measure and a probable flow of economic benefit, but it's different in that we don't do it on the risk and rewards of ownership transfer. We recognize it by the stage of completion of the contract. So that's different and we'll do an example of it shortly. Before we do so, I want to give you some specifics to look out for. Um, other types of revenue would be interest. Well, look, interest is done on the accruals basis. So you would time apportion the interest based on accruing in interest that perhaps you haven't received or in fact, 
received would be the way because we're not paying interest here. It's revenue, so we are receiving it. So you'll recognize it on the accruals basis. Royalties, well, that depends on the contract. So based on the contract terms, you would recognize the revenue based on that. And lastly, dividends. Well, dividend income is recognized when the right to receive it is established. And that would generally be when the dividend is announced. So look out for those. Also look out for a uh, deposits because if a customer has paid you a deposit, unless of course it's a non-refundable deposit, in which case you can recognize the revenue straight away because you don't have to pay it back. But if it is refundable, if the transaction doesn't occur, well then you can only recognize it once the goods are delivered to the customer. Until then, you'll hold it as a liability. So if a customer pays you a deposit, it's debit cash, credit, a liability, until the goods are delivered, and then you can recognize the revenue. Also, if there is revenue on a sale or return basis, so this is where you are selling goods to a customer, but they have the right to return them if they want to within 30 days, if they don't sell them on to their customers. Well, you've got to think about the transfer of the risk and rewards of ownership here. And that won't happen until they have been sold on by your customer. So you can recognize them when the returns period is up, or if you have a number or a percentage that have been sold by that customer, if they've sold them on, you can recognize it as they sell them on. But if they haven't sold them on, you cannot recognize the revenue until the returns period is up because the risk and reward remains with the seller until then. Because of course, they could return them to you. So those are a few to look out for. Lastly, what if we've got a contract that includes both goods and services? So we have a package, for example, a computer with an agreement to service it for a number of years. So if we've sold a computer with an agreement to service it for a number of years and we've been paid an upfront amount, how do we recognize that revenue? Well, what we need to do is separate it out. We'll separate it into the goods part and the services part and recognize it in that way. The goods on delivery and the services by stage of completion of the contract. If we've been paid up front, well, that means some of the income will be deferred until we actually carry out the contract. So separate it out if it can be sold independently and you can get a reliable fair value for each item in the contract. So let's have a look at how we would do that in illustration two. In illustration two, we have an IT system which is paid up front, 300,000, but it includes support. So how much will we recognize in the current year? Well, remember, we can split this between the goods and the services. So that's the first part, split the contract. Now, the total is 300, which means that we have 50,000 per year for three years on the services. So that will be hardware will be the 300,000 less the amount for the services which is 50,000 for three years. So that means 150,000 was for goods. The rest was for the services. Remember the 50,000 over three years. And that gives us total revenue of 300,000. So what do we do with this? Well, we can recognize upfront the goods, which is 150,000, because they've all been delivered, the transfer of the risk and rewards of ownership has happened. And then we can recognize one year's services because we're looking for three years worth 
at a total of 150,000, one year's being 50,000. So that means the total revenue we recognize is 200,000. The rest will be deferred. So it's deferred income. Remember, debit cash, credit deferred income if you're not recognizing it immediately. So that's how we would go about splitting the contract between the goods and the services. That then was our session on revenue recognition. Once again, it's relatively small, but it's very important and it's often examined. So you need to know when to recognize the revenue on goods and the difference between that and recognizing it on services. Look out for deposits and goods sold on sale or return. And of course, separate contracts where you may well have to separate out the goods and services and recognize each according to what it is.